I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Susan Morrell. We're delighted to speak with this author who is the writer of a wonderful book. It is called The Pleasure of My Company, Finding the Motivation and Courage to Spend Time Alone. And she is now presenting her latest work on Falcon Wings. This intimate memoir, curated from a lifetime of journals, essays, poems, and stories, stands as a legacy to future generations, especially her very adorable, very cute, cherished grandnephews. We are delighted to have Susan join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the folks at the book Publishing Solutions for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to our channel. Susan, so good to see you today. Well, it's good to see you, Logan. I appreciate the time. And I think uh, your great grandnephews or your great nephews <laughs> will enjoy uh, watching their uh, great aunt on TV. <laughs> That'll probably be a thrill for them. Let's first by start out by talking about your latest work on Falcon. Sure. Let's give the folks at home the big picture. Tell them what On Falcon Wings is about and why you decided to write it and compile all of your previous works. Well, it was the COVID, the lockdown. I was living in Arizona by myself. And I was thinking people have been asking for a second book. but So I gathered all these pieces that I'd written over the years. And I hadn't read most of them for years. They'd just been buried in drawers someplace or on the computer. So as I put them all together, looking for something that might be fodder for a new book, I realized that they themselves became the book. Yeah. They they were like pieces of a puzzle. And when I started putting them together, I was the puzzle. And yeah. it, it was me that it was about. And I, I, when I do something like this, I always ask myself, why? Why are you doing it? What's your intention? Because as long as I'm aligned with my intention, I can move forward, feeling I can do this. And that's when I realized this is a legacy. This is something I can leave for my family and for whoever reads it and, and get something from it. That's so it became the memoir that it is today. Wonderful, wonderful. A lot of good things came out of COVID. It's strange, you know, yes. things that we, we're we talking today because of COVID technology. Yes. Um, and uh, you had time to compile, you know, your works, your journals, your essays, your poems, your stories because of COVID. So yes. it was kind of the best of times and the worst of times, don't you think? I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't have to say what was bad about it. We all yeah. know what that was. Right. But um, for me, it got me to do a lot of what I do normally, which is introspective work and self-reflection. But there was time to do a lot more of that, as well as to make connections with people I hadn't been in touch with for years. A yeah. lot of phone calling and talking. And that prompted more writing for me. Because yeah. I am a writer and what I do when I'm experiencing something or whatever is I, I just write about it. If nothing more than to clear it from my psyche so that I feel better, you right. know, if it's something bad or whatever. So, yeah, yeah it, it ended up being some good news came from it for me. And it was the book. Exactly. Tell us what your title on Falcon Wings means. Well, a number of years ago, I... I read a book where a peregrine falcon was one of the characters in the book. You know, there was a falconer who hunted with the falcon. And mm -hmm. I was fascinated with that. And I looked into it. And the, it's become this kind of a spirit animal for me. I just love the peregrine falcon. I've seen it in its natural habitat a number of times. I've even had one on my arm during a birds of prey exhibit. I just, I love what it's about. I love how it, the kind of bird of prey it is. And when I was putting all my work together, I decided I'm basically putting my work out to the world. Mm -hmm. And I figured I wanted the falcon in there somehow. So that's why it became, I'm putting it out to everyone on my falcon wings. I'm just giving it out there. Yeah. It's corny, but I'm from Ohio, well, so that's well, allowed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also it catch, it catches your eye, it catches your ear, and, and it's a good, good way to think of your life, that it's yes. lived on falcon wings, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. So when you were compiling all of these works, these journals, these essays, and so forth, um, 
was it like a trip back in time where you're like, oh, I forgot about oh. this, or I forgot about that moment in my life? Or, oh, tell me about that. Absolutely. It took, I mean, it didn't take me long to gather everything, right. but it took me a couple of weeks to take the time to actually read everything. Because like I said, I hadn't seen most of it in a while. Some of it's compositions from, I didn't go to college and get my degree till in my forties. Mm -hmm. So I was reading all these compositions and my journals, pulling those out and reading them again. And I, I found out so much about me and what I do a lot of is, like I said earlier, self-reflection and introspection. I like to find out why do I do things? Why did this happen? You know, whatever. So I was able to put together in my mind a lot. Of, I mean, find the patterns and find more about me just by reading everything again. Right. And um, yeah, I, I came up with I even started writing again while I was compiling the old stuff. There's new stuff in there. And I wrote um, a lot of new material. And I also wrote some explanations for each of the pieces in there to give the reader some background as to wh where that came from and why it was created. But uh, I tend to be a um, I write conversationally. I mm -hmm. write to the reader. So it was interesting reading that as the reader and yeah. learning about myself and making that reconnection with a lot of myself. Wonderful. Is there a specific story or poem in the book that holds a special place in your heart? And that's like asking who's your favorite kid. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. I'm like um, Solomon here. Choose between. Yeah, I, I would have to say. If anything, the story I start the book with is a, a folk tale I wrote called The Woman and the Falcon. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this story. My mom died in December of 91 from cancer. The following summer, I woke up from a dream about her feeling bad, crying. Mm -hmm. And I, as always, I have a tablet and a pen by my bed. The idea for this story came. Now, about a year before that, I had come up with a metaphor for my relationship with my mom. I was very close with her. Mm -hmm. And I used to ask her, Mom, I live this nomadic life. I'm all over the place. I'm not giving you grandkids or whatever. Mm -hmm. She says, Susan, I'm living vicariously through you. You do what you need to do when you need to do it. I'm here. Right. So I said, Mom, you are my falconer and I am your falcon because you just let me go, but I can always come home whenever yeah. I want. So I wrote this folktale story and it deals with, you know, the whole relationship. I don't want to give it away. I'll right, let readers right. read it. Right. But uh, that would probably be a favorite because of how it sums up that relationship and why the book is what it is. That exactly. would be a favorite. Yeah. 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 It's such a nice uh, sentiment that you describe and they write about because you know, there's nothing like going back home to mom, oh, going back to yes. her house, wherever it is. And, you know, I lost my and, mother in 2004. And, you know, yeah, I feel like there is no home. Your own home is your own home, but it's different. Going and home no matter. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's no, so no. right. Yeah. If there are times I want my mommy. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or my daddy. You know, know my I dad know. was 51 when he died. My mom was 63. They they died much too young. Yeah. And I am the oldest grandchild, oldest child. So a couple of years ago, my last aunt died right. of my all the adults. And now I am what my brother loves to remind me. Susan, you are our matriarch. I said, oh, geez. <laughs> I, know, <it's laughs> I still feel like that kid who wants her mommy. It's, <laughs> so it's hard to make that relationship. But exactly. yeah, I guess that's what I am. I know. I know. My mom used to say, everybody around you ages, <laughs> you stay the same. So uh, I always uh, use that as my framework, you know, because I, I do, I feel the same. I feel the same as if I'm 25 years old. Yes. But obviously, <laughs> people aren't looking at a 25-year-old anymore, but uh, this 61-year-old <laughs> still wants his mommy also. So uh, we're in the same boat there. Let's yeah. talk about your other book, uh, The Pleasure of My Company, Finding Motivation and Courage to Spend Time Alone. It's amazing that this is so difficult for some people because yeah. I can travel to a city and go into a restaurant and be, don't have to hide behind a book. And, you know, I enjoy my time alone and you do too. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's yes. such a wonderful, liberating thing. So let's talk a little bit about your book, The Pleasure of My Company. 
Okay. Um, yeah, like I said, I've lived a nomadic life. I mean, I, I just moved around. I, I, I didn't have a career that kept me in one place or required me to be locked down someplace. Yeah. I've lived in New York and Chicago and Phoenix and Vegas and Southern Cal and back and forth to Ohio in between. I I got married when I lived in New York and then I, I got divorced. So I've had re- the relationship going in there. Mm-hmm. But um, I had a friend who every time somebody would want me to tell a story about, oh, I went here by myself or I did this by myself. She said, Susan, would you just put your stories in a book? I'm getting tired of hearing them. Just hand right. them a book. Right. So I did. <laughs> That's great. And what I found in talking to people about this is, I, I did some of that stuff just naturally. Right. But I recognize now how difficult it is for some people to do that. Yeah. Now, I'm a meditator. I've been meditating since my mid-20s. So I value my still moments and calm time. So I think that's part of what contributes to what yeah. I can do. Yeah. I, I also... I think it's also being like self-assured enough to feel like not everybody is looking at you wondering why you're alone. You know what I yes. mean? It just... You're alone because none of your friends are with you right now or none of your family is with you right now. So what, you know? Oh, and that's it. I I, I mean, I there were moments, but the first time I went to a movie by myself, yeah. it, I, all this self-talk went on. Like, right. Susan, everybody's going to look at you. You're in <laughs> Boston. You're on business. No, who's going to know? No one, you know. So you right. do that back and forth with yourself and then you just do it. Yeah. And I had to talk myself into stuff. And there are some things I wouldn't consider doing alone because it's more fun with someone else. Right. I'm not right. a hermit. I'm not antisocial. Right. But as I explain in my book, my relationships are enhanced by what I can bring to them about my experiences that I've done by myself. Absolutely. And I don't want to miss out on something just because I can't find someone to do it with me. Exactly. I mean, I mean you know, yeah. you have your whole life to live. At times you might have a partner, a husband, a wife, or a friend or whatever it is, but other times you don't. Right. Go out and live your life. Go out and do, go out and explore, become an engaged person, become an interesting person. I also find it interesting about your story is you were nomadic before it was cool to be nomadic. I mean, everybody's a digital nomad now, but uh, back when you were doing it, it was unusual. So tell me how you got caught up in this nomadic life and uh, what type of work Hmm. you were were doing that uh, supported that. Well, for years, I mean, when I first started working after high school. I was living in Ohio, in my hometown, working at a bank and all this stuff. And then my best friend graduated college and we went to New York. And that was great. But then I I wanted to transfer to Phoenix with Xerox. I worked for Xerox. So I just went. I hadn't even seen the town. I just did it. And that's when people said, boy, are you brave? I'm going, but it's my job. So I got there. (laughs) And most of the work I do is along the lines of administration, management, administration. I, I'm a trainer. I'm a speaker. Right. And so that's worked its way into all my jobs. I've done computer programming and all of that. Um, I think it, I write about this in, in both of my books. Part of me is Hungarian. So I figure there's the gypsy blood in me. <laughs> and when I was little, I traveled with my maternal grandparents every summer, road trips. It's before before we flew everywhere. Right. We were in the car all the time. And I'm in the back seat with the AAA map, figuring out where we were going. I yeah. loved it. Yeah. I, I think my grandparents didn't realize what they were creating by taking me on those trips. Right. And so I just I just find it interesting. I want to live different places. When I've moved, it's it's like, you know, Chicago, I love Chicago. I went and visited. So I'm going to move there. Right. So it's mostly been interest. I spent a month in Great Britain by myself. I mean, I can't get anybody to go and do that with me. (laughs) And I I drove around. And yes, by the third week, I was like, oh, gosh, I wish so-and-so were here so we could play cards or do something. So it's not saying it's all all great. I had moments where I was lonely, where I wanted someone. But for the most part, I did okay. And sometimes people are lonely even when they're with someone. (sighs) Yes. That's See, the dirty you, little secret. Yeah. Have you, you been know? peeking at my book? Is that, <laughs> because I at, right up front in the book, I, I don't just talk about my anecdotes about doing things by myself. Right. But I immediately ask the reader, what's your definition of alone? 
And here's some different meanings of it. You you can go from forlorn to, you know, whatever. Uh, But what I recognized was solitude never came up. And again, the meditator in me values the solitude and my connection, my spiritual connection to the universe comes through my meditation and my time alone and my writing. That's all connected for me. And a lot of that I recognized more and more as I was reading my pieces to put in the other, the new book. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. you have to be comfortable with yourself right. before you can be, be comfortable with someone else. Exactly, exactly. Now, since you are so nomadic and you do like different places and challenges, mm-hmm. I can't see you staying in Ohio very long. So what is on your roadmap? Where are you going? What are you going to see? What are you going to explore? Well, that's a good question because just the other day, I've only been here about 15 months, but the other day I was thinking, okay, Susan, uh-oh, <laughs> this is, I'm getting those questions for myself. Where would you want to go next? Right. And I'm thinking, do I want to go someplace next or do I want to move and redo something? Like if I were to move to the East Coast again, I've got friends in New Jersey, Connecticut, New York. I lived there two different times and I would love to be near them, but I'm not crazy about the area anymore. Right. A little too crowded and congested. Chicago is my favorite metropolitan city. Right. I just because it's mid, it's New York, but Midwest. Exactly. So I have everything from the best of both worlds for me. Exactly. Oh, Logan, where I'd want to go. Um, any suggestions? Um, <laughs> it's funny that you say that. You know, it's interesting. There's a difference between traveling and living. Mm-hmm. And I've as a news reporter, I've had the pleasure of living in different cities. Like I went to live in Providence, Rhode Island without really ever seeing it. Atlanta, yeah. Georgia, without really ever seeing it. Oh, wow. And they were great places. And I'm so glad I lived there. It would have been <laughs> so much different if it was just a visit. Um, where the road will take you next. I mean, that's hard to say. Maybe uh, take a uh, dart and throw it at the dartboard. And we're that's possible. Yeah. yeah, that's possible. Absolutely. You never know. I'd never say never. So and right. my family knows that, too. They know I'm here, but right. they also know I could be, be saying I'm putting my house for sale. I'm out of here, you know, whenever <laughs> it goes, whenever it sells. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> I know. It's funny. Um, I just got married a year ago and uh-huh. we, uh, took a honeymoon, which was a road trip. Uh, so oh. uh, we're kindred spirits, you and I, Susan, uh, we're right. anywhere. We had no plan for it at all. We Great. just drove and, you know, I particularly loved the West. Once I got out yes. there, I loved, uh, you know, uh, Yellowstone National Park and the mm. Grand Tetons and uh, that whole area yes. of Montana and Wyoming. So Wyoming is something I think you should look at. That was I've been there. Okay. <laughs> I've been there. Well, like I said, there's a difference between being there and living there. <laughs> Although uh, that's true. That's that true. true. Absolutely. So what's next for your writing? Um, I know you just came out with on Falcon Wings, but uh, are you working on anything else, at least in your head? Oh, and, you might, uh... and, and, and in both cases, I wasn't working on them. Yeah. They just kind of came about. So I, right. I I pretty much allow, you know, the universe to kind of push it at me when it's when it's ready. I have thought about as I'm doing this where I could maybe go different places with specific, specifically talking about how the meditation and my self-reflection, there's a lot inside of that, that I don't expand on so much in the new book, because it's just in the stories. But it's something as a reader, if you're reading it all, you'll pick up on it. So I'm thinking maybe I need to write a book that talks more about that and the value of it, whatever that is. I don't know. Yep, I'm not absolutely. committed to anything right now, though. S- sounds good. Before you leave, <laughs> okay. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you mm-hmm. a very pointed question okay. about your beautiful grand nephews. Tell me about them. Well, my I back up a little bit. I, I was the oldest. I had a sister and a brother 13 years younger than me. My sister and I both married, divorced, no kids. My brother... He's the, he's the old, he's like my older, younger, my younger, older brother. Yep. He's like the old, excuse me, the, the old, old person in the, of the family. family. Yes, that's yep. it. And he had three wonderful kids. And I said, thank you for having and raising my kids for me. So my <laughs> nieces and nephew are mine. I'm a 
perfect aunt. Right. Now, my oldest niece settled in Columbus after she graduated from Ohio State and got married and had these two little boys. James is seven and a half and Luke will be five at the end of the month. As he keeps reminding me, Susie, I'll be five at the end of the month. I said, okay, on the 31st. And it's just a delight to see them because I think of their mom still at that age. I mean, yep. you know, don't parents do that? You always see them at the different ages they're at. Yep. But um, it's it's they're they're right down the street from where I live. So right. I can we can walk back and forth. I help my niece, niece watch them if she needs it. And it's just it's just a delight to watch them it's, as they're growing. It's just it's great. Yeah. You know what? When you get older, there's no greater joy in the world than watching children play. Oh. I mean, it reminds us of our own youth, our own innocence. And I have the same reaction that you have when I see my great nieces. It's just like I'm crazy <laughs> about them. I was crazy about my kids, uh, but now they're boring. They're like <laughs> late, early 30s. And, you know, that's a boring age. But to see my little, you know, five-year-old and three-year-old great uh, yes that's magic that's magic and, and that makes you want to play and keeps us it, that it, youthful feeling and stuff it's, it's exactly, all part of it exactly well susan morell has written two wonderful books one is called the pleasure of my company finding motivation and courage to spend time alone and if you listen to susan today you realize it's kind of easy to do if you take that first step, but read this book. It'll give you a lot of insight and a lot of knowledge and a lot to reflect upon. She has written a wonderful memoir as well. It is called On Falcon Wings, which is a collection from her lifetime of keeping journals, essays, poems, and stories. And it is a legacy for future generations. We are delighted to have Susan join us here today on Spotlight. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Logan. I, I had a fun time. Thank you. I had a fun time as well. You're great to speak with. And to the Thank folks you. at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time until next time on Spotlight.